Hello everyone, and welcome back to the introductory module on organometallics and homogeneous catalysis. In this lecture, we will explore the distinctions between the assigned formal oxidation state and the actual charge of the metal and transition metal complexes. We will delve into non-innocent ligands and their impact on altering the formal oxidation state of the metal and catalysis. Additionally, we will briefly address the effects of complexation and how the metal modulates the reactivity of coordinated ligands. Before we delve into the specific details about non-innocent ligands, it is worth recalling what we understand under the oxidation state of transition metal complexes. The oxidation state of a metal in a complex is simply the integer charge that the metal would have on the ionic model. For a neutral complex, this is the number of X-type ligands. For example, ferrocene has two L2X type ligands and so ferrocene is said to contain iron too. For a complex ion, we need also to take account of the net charge. For example, in this positively charged ferrocene analog we have iron 3, and in negatively charged tungsten pentacarbonyl shown here the formal oxidation state of tungsten is minus 2. It is often useful to refer to the oxidation state and deconfiguration of a metal. But these only represent a formal classification and do not indicate either the real partial charge on the metal or even the trends in that charge as the ligands are changed. It is therefore important not to read too much into them. That is why ferrocene is considered as an iron 2 and not as an iron 2 plus compound. Iron 2 plus would only be appropriate for a predominantly ionic compound, such as hexaqua iron 2 sulfate. Similarly, tungsten hexahydride, in spite of being tungsten 6, is likely to be closer to tungsten hexacarbonyl than to tungsten trioxide in terms of the real charge on tungsten. In real terms, tungsten 6 hexahydride is probably more reduced and more electron rich than tungsten hexacarbonyl which is formally tungsten zero. Carbon monoxide groups are excellent pi acceptors, so the metal in tungsten hexacarbonyl has a much lower electron density than a free tungsten zero atom. On the other hand, the tungsten hydrogen bond in tungsten hexahydride is only weakly polar, and so the polyhydride has a much higher electron density than the tungsten six suggested by its oxidation state. For this reason, in organometallic chemistry, the use of the term formal oxidation state is more appropriate. The maximum permitted oxidation state of a complex can never exceed the group number of the metal. Titanium can have no higher oxidation state than titanium-4, corresponding to minimum allowed deconfiguration of D0. If we now add an additional alkoxy group to this titanium-4 complex, it can no longer remain neutral and should be depicted as a minus-1 complex, as shown here. Likewise, there is also a minimum oxidation state corresponding to the maximum number of D electrons the metal can have, which is effectively tin for the D-shell. Platinum-0 complex bearing three phosphine ligands complies with the 18-electron rule, making it theoretically possible. However, a D12 platinum-2 complex would be prohibited. These limitations need to be borne in mind when proposing intermediates and reaction mechanisms. An increase in the positive ionic charge of a complex with this general formula decreases any backbonding to the ligands, all else being equal. It also makes the complex harder to oxidize, but easier to reduce and changes the reactivity toward nucleophiles and electrophiles. For example, the carbonyl complexes shown here are isoelectronic, but only the negatively charged complex reacts readily with electrophilic proton, and only the cation reacts readily with the nucleophilic molecules like water, while neutral chromium hexacarbonyl does not react with any of these reagents. More problematic are cases in which even the formal oxidation state is ambiguous and cannot be specified. This problem affects any ligand that has several resonance forms that contribute to a comparable extent to the real structure but give different oxidation state assignments. This behavior makes the ligand non-innocent. For example, in one of the resonance forms of butadiene, it acts as an L2-type ligand, while there are resonance forms where butadiene behaves as an LX2-type ligand. The binding of butadiene as an L2-type ligand leaves the oxidation state of the metal unchanged, but when it functions as an LX2-type ligand, the oxidation state of the metal becomes more positive by two units. The oxidation state ambiguity can become severe. In the case of tris butadiene molybdenum, we can attribute any even oxidation between molybdenum-0 and molybdenum-6 by counting the butadienes as LX2 or L2-type ligands. Fortunately, the electron count is unambiguous because it always remains the same for all resonance forms. To avoid misunderstanding, it is therefore necessary to specify the resonance form to which a formal oxidation state applies. For neutral ligands, such as butadiene, convention normally calls for the neutral form, 
L2 type ligand in this case. Yet structural studies on molybdenum show that butadiene often more closely resembles LX2 type ligand. In this tungsten complex, the S donor behaves as a dithione L2 ligand, making the metal D6 tungsten zero. Accordingly, the central carbon carbon bond of the dithione is long, the carbon sulfur bond is short, and the metal is octahedral. A small change in the substituents on the dithione leads to a different complex, where the metal has reduced the ligand by two electrons to give an ene dithiolate. This is an X2 ligand, making the metal D4 tungsten 2. The ligand carbon carbon bond is now short. The carbon-sulfur bond is long, and the metal geometry has converted to trigonal prismatic. Rather than the range of intermediate structures common for butadiene, we now see two sharply defined ligand types in different compounds, distinguishable from X-ray structural data. First-row metals typically have stable oxidation states one unit apart and undergo one-electron redox changes as a result. The second and third row typically have stable oxidation states two units apart and prefer two electron redox changes. In catalysis, when organometallics have to bring about multi electron reactions, two electron redox steps are desirable because they avoid high energy, odd electron intermediates. Although second and third row metals have been preferred up to now, the price rises of the precious metals and the green chemistry aspiration of avoiding rare elements means that first row substitutes will increasingly be sought. Redox active, non innocent ligands may help in this respect by providing an alternative source or sink of electrons in addition to the metal, thus potentially allowing multi electron chemistry for the cheap first row metals. Pincers and porphyrins are specially favored for redox activity because of the greater degree of multi-ring delocalization possible in these more extended ligand systems. Another non-innocent ligand class can gain or lose protons easily, in this case from the NH groups in the imidazole ring. Deprotonation alters the ligand class from L3 to LX2, which has a big influence on the properties of the complex. Chirik and his co-workers made significant advancements in applying this concept in catalysis involving the first-row metal complexes. Here one can see an example based on formal iron 2 catalyzed 2 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction. The reaction commences with an X2 L-type iron pincer complex, where the formal oxidation state of iron is 2. In the subsequent steps, a diene is coordinated to the iron complex, which is followed by the reductive coupling of the two olefin subunits. Notably, the formal oxidation state of iron appears to remain unchanged, while the pincer ligand undergoes oxidation to become an L3-type ligand. In the final step of the process, a reductive elimination occurs to yield the product, without causing reduction of the metal in the complex. Instead, the pincer ligand is reduced back to an X2L-type ligand. Now let's focus more on the effects of complexation. The chemical character of many ligands is profoundly modified on binding to the metal. For the full range of metal fragments in this general formula, there is a smooth gradation of metal properties from strongly sigma acceptor to strongly pi basic. Accordingly, in this complex, a typical unsaturated ligand, noted as Q, loses charge and becomes more electrophilic due to a sigma acceptor metal fragment. Conversely, the Q ligand gains electrons and, as a result, becomes more nucleophilic under the influence of a pi basic metal fragment. As an example, free benzene is very resistant to attack by nucleophiles, but reacts with electrophiles. In the benzene-chromium tricarbonyl complex, in contrast, the chromium tricarbonyl fragment, as a good acceptor by virtue of its three carbon monoxide ligands, depletes the electron density on the aromatic ring. This makes the bound benzene susceptible to nucleophilic attack, but resistant to electrophilic attack. Inversion of the typical reactivity pattern on binding is termed umpolung. If the metal in this generalized complex is in the middle range of electronic properties and is both a sigma acceptor and a pi donor, it might seem that the Q ligand would differ little from free Q in chemical character. In fact, the ligand can still be strongly activated by polarization. Sigma donation from the ligand to the metal usually depletes the electron density on the ligand donor atom, while pi back donation from the metal can raise the electron density on remote atoms in the Q ligand. A good example is molecular nitrogen where the free ligand is nonpolar and notoriously unreactive. In the nitrogen complex, sigma donation to the metal comes from a lone pair on the nitrogen atom on the left. The back bonding from the metal goes into a pi antibonding orbital of molecular nitrogen. This means that the nitrogen atom on the left tends to become positively charged and the nitrogen atom on the right negatively charged on binding. This polarization enhances reactivity of the coordinated molecular nitrogen 
facilitating protonation at the nitrogen atom on the right and nucleophilic attack at the nitrogen atom on the left. The effects of complexation are summarized in this table. If a ligand is normally reactive toward, say, nucleophiles, we can deactivate it by binding to a nucleophilic metal. The metal can then act as a protecting group. A ligand that is a note toward nucleophilic attack can be activated by binding to an electrophilic metal. Protection requires a stoichiometric amount of metal to be effective and is no longer popular, while activation needs only a catalytic amount. Paradoxically, stronger metal ligand binding does not always lead to stronger ligand activation. For example, hydrogen gas is most highly acidified on weak binding. The pK of hydrogen gas is near 35 when free, but often lies in the range from 0 to 20 for bound hydrogen with the weakly bound ligands being most acidified. This is because the strength of metal hydrogen binding largely depends on the degree of pi back donation, but stronger back donation reduces the positive charge on hydrogen that comes from the sigma donation from the ligand to metal. A knowledge of the behavior of free organic carbene, diene, or other species can be misleading in trying to understand their complexes. For example, dienes react with dienophiles in the Diels-Alder reaction, but diene complexes do not give this reaction. In a sense, the complex is already a Diels-Alder adduct, with the metal as the dienophile. The properties of both the metal ions and the ligands are profoundly altered upon complex formation. For example, cobalt-3 is very strongly oxidizing in simple salts, such as the acetate, which can even oxidize hydrocarbons. Werner's work showed that most of this oxidizing power can be quenched by binding six ammonias to the cobalt-3 ion. The presence of six strong sigma donor ligands in the resulting complex ion stabilizes the high oxidation state. Conversely, elemental molybdenum or iron is strongly reducing. However, molybdenum hexacarbonyl and iron pentacarbonyl are air stable with only modest reducing properties, despite being based on iron zero and molybdenum zero. This is because carbon monoxide removes electron density from the metal through back donation, thus strongly stabilizing the low oxidation state of the metal. A hard ligand tends to form ionic metal ligand bonds, where the ligand retains more negative charge compared to soft ligands. This allows the metal ion to retain more of its positive charge, thus attracting additional hard ligands. Good examples are the hexahydrate ions of first-row D-block metals. In contrast, binding soft ligands softens the metal, enabling it to bind other soft ligands, as seen in potassium ferrocyanide. This phenomenon is known as the symbiotic effect. The antisymbiotic effect, also referred to as transphobia, applies to pairs of soft ligands with a high trans effect on a soft metal. When a choice exists, there is a strong tendency for such ligands to avoid being trans to each other. High trans effect ligands tend to become cis and prefer to have low trans effect hard ligands as trans to themselves. These isomeric iridium complexes illustrate this point. The hard hydrides prefer to be cis to each other and have soft aqua ligands in the trans positions. Having water in the trans positions allows each hydride to monopolize covalent bonding along its own axis. To summarize, in this lecture, we have learned about the main distinctions between formal oxidation states and actual charges and transition metal complexes. You have been introduced to non-innocent ligands, which can undergo oxidation reduction reactions or exhibit unusual electronic behavior when coordinating with a metal ion in a coordination complex. Finally, you have been acquainted with the effects of complexation and how the chemical properties and reactivity of different molecules can change upon complexation with a metal. In the final installment of this series of lectures, we will discuss the relationship between coordination number and geometry in transition metal complexes. Thank you for your attention.